The Sayings of Lao Tzu by Lao Tzu, translated by Lionel Giles. Introduction. With rare modesty and intelligent self-appreciation, Confucius described himself as a transmitter, not a maker, one who loved and believed in the ancients. This judicious estimate fairly sums up the position of China's most prominent teacher. Incalculable though his influence has been over millions of the human race, it is due, rather, to his sterling common sense, backed by the moral strength of his character, than to any striking intellectual power or novelty in his ideas. But some fifty years before the time of Confucius, there lived another great Chinese, who, besides being a lover of antiquity, takes high rank as a profound and original thinker. Apart from the thick crop of legend and myth which soon gathered around his name, very little is known about the life and personality of Lao Tzu, and even the meager account preserved for us in the history of Tzu Tzma Qian must be looked upon with suspicion. All the alleged meetings and conversations with Confucius may safely be rejected, not only on account of chronological difficulties, but because they are exactly the sort of invention which would be likely to pass current in an early and uncritical age. We need not, however, go so far as those who impugn the very existence of Lao Tzu as an individual and regard the book which passes under his name as a mere collection of scraps of ancient proverbial philosophy. Some color, indeed, is lent to this theory by the uncertainty that attaches to the proper interpretation of the name Lao Tzu, which is variously explained as one, old boy, because he is said to have been born with a white beard, but we may rather suspect that the story was invented to explain the name. Two, son of Lao, this being the surname of the virgin mother who conceived him at the sight of a falling star. Or three, old philosopher, because of the great age at which he wrote his immortal book, the Tao Te Ching. The mention of this classic, or Treatise of the Way and of Virtue, as it may be translated for want of better English equivalents, brings us naturally to the vexed question as to whether the text which has come down to us can really be attributed to the hand of Lao Tzu, or whether it is not rather a garbled and unauthorized compilation of his sayings, or even the mere forgery of a later age. The Chinese themselves, it may be remarked, are almost unanimous in denying its authenticity. It has been urged that we must make allowance here for Confucian bias, but the internal evidence alone should suffice to dispel the notion, to which many eminent sinologues have clung, that the Tao Te Ching in its present form can possibly represent the actual work of Lao Tzu. On the other hand, it is highly probable that much of it is substantially what he said, or wrote, though carelessly collected and pieced together at random. Tzu Ma Qian, who published his history in 91 BC, and was consequently removed from Lao Tzu by a much longer period than we are from Shakespeare, tells us that the sage wrote a book of five thousand and odd words, and, indeed, by that time, the Tao Te Ching may possibly have existed in something like its present shape. But anyone who reflects on the turbulent condition of China during the intervening centuries and the chaotic state of primitive literature before the labors of Confucius, to say nothing of the burning of the books in 213 BC, will find it hard to convince himself that Su Ma Qian ever had before him the actual writings of the philosopher. Arbitrary and confused though the arrangement of the Tao Te Ching appears, it is possible to trace a coherent line of thought throughout the whole. And, although no coiner of paradox on such an extensive scale as Lao Tzu could hope to achieve absolute and invariable consistency, it is easy to see that the Tao Te Ching is something more than a mere jumble of stray aphorisms. That it is, in fact, the well-defined though rudimentary outline of a great system of transcendental and ethical philosophy. That this magnificent scheme of thought never reached its full expression in Lao Tzu's treatment is largely due to the fact that he is perpetually struggling to convey his ideas through the medium of a language 
still imperfectly developed and forming an inadequate vehicle for obtrusive philosophical conceptions this too combined with an extraordinary conciseness of diction is the cause of the obscurity which hangs over several portions of the text and which the labors of innumerable commentators have done very little to clear away to the wide scope thus afforded for the imagination we owe the startling discoveries in the body of the work of the doctrine of the trinity and of the hebrew word for jehovah thinly disguised in its chinese dress sad to say both of these once famous theories are now totally discredited the real value of the Tao Te Ching lies not in such puerilities, but in its wealth of suggestive hints and pregnant phrases, each containing a world of thought in itself, incapable of expansion into volumes. Whether Lao Tzu ever developed the germs of thought, thrown out with such prodigality, we do not know. At any rate, no record of the development remains. And if Lao Tzu failed to work out his own system, the task was never satisfactorily accomplished by those who came after him. It is true that an enormous superstructure of Taoist literature has been raised upon the slender foundation of the Tao Te Ching, but these Taoist writers soon forsook the austerity of Lao Tzu's way for the more attractive fields of ritual and magic. Lao Tzu was a Socrates who never found a Plato or an Aristotle to reap the goodly harvest he had sown even chuang tzu the greatest of his followers whose exquisite literary style contrasts strangely with the rugged sentences of the Tao te ching scarcely seems to have caught the true spirit of his master and is apt to lose himself in the vague speculations of a dreamy mysticism lao tzu's work however was able to command attention on its own merits it was first officially recognized as a canon or classic under the emperor ching ti b c one fifty six to one forty of the han dynasty after which the study of tao survived many vicissitudes being now under a cloud and now again in high favor at court one emperor was in the habit of holding forth on the doctrines of lao tzu before his assembled ministers and would forthwith degrade any one who stretched yawned or spat during his discourse Another published an edition of the Tao Te Ching, which described in the preface as the root of all things, the teacher of kings, and the most precious jewel of the public. The first emperor of the latter Qin dynasty asked if Tao was of any use in government. Chang Chiang Ming told him that with Tao a corpse could govern the empire. By successive edicts, the Tao Te Ching was made obligatory at the examination for graduates of the second degree everyone was required to possess a copy of the work and it was cut on stone at both capitals later on printed copies were distributed to all directors of education and it was translated into the language of new chan tatars finally kubla khan ordered all taoist books to be burnt with the exception of the tao te ching thus showing a just appreciation of the gulf separating Lao Tzu from the later writers on Tao. In view of the disjointed and inartistic character of the work, and its antagonism to many of the principles of orthodox Confucianism, it is a small wonder that native scholars, with true Chinese subordination of matter to form, seldom profess to hold it in great esteem, and indeed its qualities are not such as would strongly appeal to an essentially hard-headed in materialistic race yet on reflection it will certainly appear that the teaching of lao tzu has not been barren of practical results the great political lesson of laissez-faire is one that the chinese people has well assimilated and perhaps carried to excess it may even be said to impregnate their national life more thoroughly than any doctrine of confucius from two great evils of modern civilization the bane of over-legislation, and the pest of meddlesome and overbearing officialdom, China is remarkably free, and in few other countries does the individual enjoy such absolute liberty of action. Thus, on the whole, 
the chinese may be said to have adopted lao tzu's main principles of government with no small success it is hard to believe that a rigidly despotic empire encumbered with an irksome array of laws and statutes could have remained homogeneous and intact throughout so lengthy a period who can doubt that the enormous bulk of china has managed to defy the disintegrating action of time by reason of its very inertness and placidity it has been suggested that lao tzu may have reached this doctrine of non-interference by observing that the supreme power tao governs the universe by fixed laws and yet leaves to man an apparently unrestricted freedom of will be this as it may he was undoubtedly the first man to preach the gospel of peace and intelligent inaction being in this as in many other respects far in advance of his age in those troublesome times when the land was torn by internecine feuds and the spirit of materialism was rife it is not a little remarkable to find him expressing unqualified abhorrence of war though to be sure this was but the logical outcome of his system of quietism few can help being struck by the similarity of tone between the sayings of lao tzu and the gospel enunciated six centuries later by the prince of peace there are two famous utterances in particular which secure to lao tzu the glory of having anticipated the lofty morality of the sermon on the mount the cavaliers who had ranked the golden rule of confucius below that of christ will find it hard to get over the fact that lao tzu said requite injury with kindness and to the not good i would be good in order to make them good it was a hundred and fifty years later that plato reached the same conclusion in the first book of the republic it is interesting to observe certain points of contact between lao tzu and the early greek philosophers he may be compared both with parmenides who disparaged sense knowledge and taught the existence of the one as opposed to the many and with Herculitus, whose theory of the identity of contraries recalls some of our sages paradoxes but it is when we come to plato that the most striking parallels occur it has not escaped notice that something like the platonic doctrine of ideas is discoverable in the forms which lao tzu conceives as residing in tao but so far as i know no one has yet pointed out what a close likeness tao itself bears to that curious abstraction which plato calls the idea of the good the function and attributes of this grandiose conception are not set forth quite so fully or clearly as those of tao but it certainly covers a great deal more than the ordinary moral connotation of our word good it is at once the creative and sustaining cause of the universe the condition of all knowledge and the summum bonum or supreme object of man's desire being a metaphysical entity it cannot be perceived by the eye or ear of sense and is therefore ridiculed by the inferior man of little intelligence while only the few can enter into close communion with it now all of this might stand equally well as a description of tao on the other hand the inactivity and repose which are so insisted on by the chinese thinker as the primary characteristics of tao would have been less intelligible to the greek and seem to bring us nearer to buddhism the lack of reliable information about lao tzu is very disappointing one cannot help wishing that some of the less important details touching the life of confucius could be exchanged for an authentic personal account however brief of his older contemporary all that we know for certain is that after having spent most of his life in the state of chow he set out at an advanced age towards the west passed the frontier and was never heard of again thus lao tzu's gigantic figure looms but indistinctly through the mist of ages and to gather some idea of his personality we must be content to fall back on his own rough-hewn sentences there is one striking passage in which he describes himself half sarcastically and half in earnest as a dullard and a clown compared with ordinary men and this he seems to indicate is the result of his adherence to tao 
these words evidently written in great bitterness of spirit may have been wrung from him by a sense of his failure to convert the careless generation which would have none of the tao he venerated as the most precious thing under heaven in showing himself the man of tao in such a disadvantageous light his meaning was probably much the same as that of plato in the allegory of the cave where he depicts the blindness and bewilderment of those who descend once more into the darkness of their prison after having contemplated the dazzling brilliance of the sun lao tzu's despondency would have been greater still could he have foreseen how his pure and idealistic teaching was destined to be dragged in the mire of degrading superstition which for centuries has made taoism a byword of reproach though frequently described as one of the three religions of china this cult is really little more than an extricable mass of jugglery and fraud absorbed from various popular beliefs and other sources including even the rival creed of buddhism and conducted by a body of priests recruited from the very dregs of the empire such a fate however is less to be wondered at than deplored seeing that the great founder himself took no pains to establish a practicable system he propounded lofty sentiments and neglected the homely details without which his ideas could not bear fruit moreover when all is said and done idealism can never hope to hold its own in human affairs until indeed the new era dawns of which plato dreamed long ago in this world of ours becomes ripe for the dominion of philosopher kings wilcott road acton june twenty one nineteen o four tao in its transcendental aspect and in its physical manifestation the tao which can be expressed in words is not the eternal tao the name which can be uttered is not its eternal name without a name it is the beginning of heaven and earth with a name it is the mother of all things only one who is ever free from desire can apprehend its spiritual essence he who is ever a slave to desire can see no more than its outer fringe these two things the spiritual and the material though we call them by different names and their origin are one and the same this sameness is a mystery the mystery of mysteries it is the gate of all wonders how unfathomable is tao it seems to be the ancestral progenitor of all things how pure and clear is tao it would seem to be everlasting i know not of whom it is the offspring it appears to have been anterior to any sovereign power tao eludes the sense of sight and is therefore called colorless it eludes the sense of hearing and is therefore called soundless it eludes the sense of touch and is therefore called incorporeal these three qualities cannot be apprehended and hence they may be blended into unity its upper part is not bright and its lower part is not obscure ceaseless in action it cannot be named but returns again to nothingness we may call it the form of the formless the image of the imageless the fleeting and the indeterminable would you go before it you cannot see its face would you go behind it you cannot see its back the mightiest manifestations of active force flow solely from tao tao in itself is vague impalpable how impalpable how vague yet within it there is form how vague how impalpable yet within it there is substance how profound how obscure yet within it there is a vital principle this principle is the quintessence of reality and out of it comes truth from of old until now its name has never passed away it watches over the beginning of all things how do i know this about the beginning of things through tao there is something chaotic yet complete which existed before heaven and earth oh 
how still it is and formless standing alone without changing reaching everywhere without suffering harm it must be regarded as the mother of the universe its name i know not to designate it i call it tao endeavoring to describe it i call it great being great it passes on passing on it becomes remote having become remote it returns therefore tao is great heaven is great earth is great and the sovereign also is great in the universe there are four powers of which the sovereign is one man takes his law from the earth the earth takes its law from heaven heaven takes its law from tao but the law of tao is its own spontaneity tao in its unchanging aspect has no name small though it be in its primordial simplicity mankind dare not claim its service could princes and kings hold and keep it all creation would spontaneously pay homage heaven and earth would unite in sending down sweet dew and the people would be righteous unbidden and of their own accord as soon as tao creates order it becomes nameable when it once has a name men will know how to rest in it knowing how to rest in it they will run no risk of harm tao as it exists in the world is like the great rivers and seas which receive the streams from the valleys all pervading is the great tao it can be at once on the right hand and on the left all things depend on it for life and it rejects them not its task accomplished it takes no credit it loves and nourishes all things but does not act as master it is ever free from desire we may call it small all things return to it yet it does not act as master we may call it great the whole world will flock to him who holds the mighty form of tao they will come and receive no hurt but find rest peace and tranquillity with music and dainties we may detain the passing guest but if we open our mouths to speak of tao he finds it tasteless and insipid not visible to the sight not audible to the ear in its use it is inexhaustible retrogression is the movement of tao weakness is the character of tao all things under heaven are products of being but being itself is the product of not being tao is a great square with no angles a great vessel which takes long to complete a great sound which cannot be heard a great image with no form tao lies hid and cannot be named yet it has the power of transmuting and perfecting all things tao produced unity unity produced duality duality produced trinity and trinity produced all existing objects these myriad objects leave darkness behind them and embrace the light being harmonized by contact with a vital force tao produces all things its virtue nourishes them each is formed according to its nature each is perfected according to its strength hence there is not a single thing but pays homage to tao and extols its virtue this homage paid to tao this extolling of its virtue is due to no command but is always spontaneous thus it is that tao engendering all things nourishes them develops them and fosters them perfects them ripens them tends them and protects them production without possession action without self-assertion development without domination this is its mysterious operation the world has a first cause which may be regarded as the mother of the world when one has found the mother one can know the child knowing the child and still keeping the mother to the end of his days he shall suffer no harm it is the way of heaven not to strive and yet it knows how to overcome not to speak and yet it knows how to obtain a response it calls not and things come of themselves it is slow to move but excellent in its designs 
heaven's net is vast though its meshes are wide it lets nothing slip through the way of heaven is like the drawing of a bow it brings down what is high and raises what is low it is the way of heaven to take from those who have too much and give to those who have too little but the way of man is not so he takes away from those who have too little to add to his own superabundance what man is there that can take of his own superabundance and give it to mankind only he who possesses tao the tao of heaven has no favorites it gives to all good men without distinction things wax strong and then decay this is the contrary of tao what is contrary to tao soon perishes tao as a moral principle or virtue the highest goodness is like water for water is excellent in benefiting all things and it does not strive it occupies the lowest place which men abhor and therefore it is near akin to tao when your work is done and fame has been achieved then retire into the background for this is the way of heaven those who follow the way desire not excess and thus without excess they are forever exempt from change all things alike do their work and then we see them subside when they have reached their bloom each returns to its origin returning to their origin means rest or fulfillment of destiny this reversion is an eternal law to know that law is to be enlightened not to know it is misery and calamity he who knows the eternal law is liberal-minded being liberal-minded he is just being just he is kingly being kingly he is akin to heaven being akin to heaven he possesses tao possessed of tao he endures forever though his body perish yet he suffers no harm he who acts in accordance with tao becomes one with tao he who treads the path of virtue becomes one with virtue he who pursues a course of vice becomes one with vice the man who is one with tao tao is also glad to receive the man who is one with virtue virtue is also glad to receive the man who is one with vice vice is also glad to receive he who is self-approving does not shine he who boasts has no merit he who exalts himself does not rise high judged according to tao such conduct is like that of a glutton an object of universal disgust therefore one who has tao will avoid it perfect virtue is unconscious of itself as virtue and therefore it is true virtue inferior virtue tries not to fall short of virtue and therefore it is not virtue at all perfect virtue is inactive having no need to act inferior virtue acts feeling the need to do so perfect charity operates without the need of anything to evoke it perfect righteousness operates but needs to be evoked perfect propriety operates and if there is no response it resorts to force when tao is lost virtue appears when virtue is lost charity appears when charity is lost righteousness appears when righteousness is lost propriety appears propriety is but the veneer of loyalty and good faith while oft times the source of disorder foreknowledge is but a showy ornament of tao while oft times the beginning of imbecility therefore the truly great man takes his stand upon what is solid and not upon what is superficial upon what is real and not upon what is ornamental he rejects the latter in favor of the former when the superior scholar hears of tao he diligently practices it when the average scholar hears of tao he sometimes retains it sometimes loses it when the inferior scholar hears of tao he loudly laughs at it were it not thus ridiculed it would not be worthy of the name of tao he who is enlightened by tao seems wrapped in darkness he who is advanced in tao seems to be going back 
he who walks smoothly in Tao seems to be on a rugged path. The man of highest virtue appears lowly. He who is truly pure behaves as though he were sullied. He who has virtue in abundance behaves as though it were not enough. He who is firm in virtue seems like a skulking pretender. He who is simple and true appears unstable as water. If Tao prevails on earth, horses will be used for purposes of agriculture. If Tao does not prevail, war horses will be bred on the common. If we had sufficient knowledge to walk in the great way, what we should most fear would be boastful display. The great way is very smooth, but the people love the bypaths. Where the palaces are very splendid, there the fields will be very waste, and the granaries very empty. The wearing of gay embroidered robes, the carrying of sharp swords, fastidiousness in food and drink, superabundance of property and wealth, this I call flaunting robbery. Most assuredly, it is not Tao. He who trusts to his abundance of natural virtue is like an infant newly born, whom venomous reptiles will not sting, wild beasts will not seize, birds of prey will not strike. The infant's bones are weak, its sinews are soft, yet its grasp is firm. All day long it will cry without its voice becoming hoarse. This is because the harmony of its bodily system is perfect. Temper your sharpness, disentangle your ideas, moderate your brilliancy, live in harmony with your age. This is being conformity with the principle of Tao. Such a man is impervious alike to favor and disgrace, to benefits and injuries, to honor and contempt, and therefore he is esteemed above all mankind. In governing men and in serving heaven, there is nothing like moderation, for only by moderation can there be an early return to man's normal state. This early return is the same as a great storage of virtue. With a great storage of virtue, there is naught which may not be achieved. If there is naught which may not be achieved, then no one will know to what extent this power reaches. And if no one knows to what extent a man's power reaches, that man is fit to be the ruler of a state. Having the secret of rule, his rule shall endure. Setting the taproot deep, and making the spreading roots firm, this is the way to ensure long life to the tree. Tao is a sanctuary where all things find refuge, the good man's priceless treasure, the guardian and savior of him who is not good. Hence, at the enthronement of an emperor and the appointment of his three ducal ministers, Though there be some who bear presents of costly jade and drive chariots with teams of four horses, that is not so good as sitting still and offering the gift of this Tao. Why was it that the men of old esteemed this Tao so highly? Is it not because it may be daily sought and found, and can remit the sins of the guilty? Hence, it is the most precious thing under heaven. All the world says that my Tao is great. But unlike other teaching, it is just because it is great that it appears unlike other teaching. If it had this likeness, long ago would its smallness have been known. The skillful philosophers of the olden time were subtle, spiritual, profound, and penetrating. They were so deep as to be incomprehensible. Because they are hard to comprehend, I will endeavor to describe them. Shrinking were they like one fording a stream in winter. Cautious were they, like one who fears an attack from any quarter. Circumspect were they, like a stranger guest, self-effacing, like ice about to melt, simple, like unpolished wood, vacant, like a valley, opaque, like muddy water. When terms are made after a great quarrel, a certain ill feeling is bound to be left behind. How can this be made good? Therefore, having entered into an agreement, the sage adheres to his obligations, but does not exact fulfillment from others. The man who has virtue attends to the spirit of the compact. The man without virtue attends only to his claims. He who tries to govern a kingdom by his sagacity 
is of that kingdom the despoiler but he who does not govern by sagacity is the kingdom's blessing he who understands these two sayings finds in them a pattern and a model to keep this pattern constantly in mind is called profound virtue profound virtue is unfathomable far-reaching the reverse of things as they are but leading to the perfect conformity with nature the doctrine of inaction the sage occupies himself with inaction and conveys instruction without words is it not by neglecting self-interest that one will be able to achieve it purge yourself of your profound intelligence and you can still be free from blemish cherish the people and order the kingdom and you can still do without meddlesome action who is there that can make muddy water clear but if allowed to remain still it will gradually become clear of itself who is there that can secure a state of absolute repose but let time go on and the state of repose will gradually arise be sparing of speech and things will come right of themselves a violent wind does not outlast the morning a squall of rain does not outlast the day such is the course of nature and if nature herself cannot sustain her efforts long how much less can man attain complete vacuity and sedulously preserve a state of repose tao is eternally inactive and yet it leaves nothing undone if kings and princes could but hold fast to this principle all things would work out their own reformation if having reformed they still desired to act i would have them restrained by the simplicity of the nameless tao the simplicity of the nameless tao brings about an absence of desire the absence of desire gives tranquillity and thus the empire will rectify itself the softest things in the world override the hardest that which has no substance enters where there is no crevice hence i know the advantage of inaction conveying lessons without words reaping profit without action there are few in the world who can attain this activity conquers cold but stillness conquers heat purity and stillness are the correct principles for mankind without going out of doors one may know the whole world without looking out of the window one may see the way of heaven the further one travels the less one may know thus it is that without moving you shall know without looking you shall see without doing you shall achieve their pursuit of book learning brings about daily increase the practice of tao brings about daily loss repeat this loss again and again and you arrive at inaction practice inaction and there is nothing which cannot be done the empire has ever been won by letting things take their course he who must always be doing is unfit to obtain the empire keep the mouth shut close the gateways of sense and as long as you live you will have no trouble open your lips and push your affairs and you will not be safe to the end of your days practice inaction occupy yourself with doing nothing desire not to desire and you will not value things difficult to obtain learn not to learn and you will revert to a condition which mankind in general has lost leave all things to take their natural course and do not interfere lowliness and humility all things in nature work silently they come into being and possess nothing they fulfill their functions and make no claim when merit has been achieved do not take it to yourself for if you do not take it to yourself it shall never be taken from you follow diligently the way in your own heart but make no display of it to the world keep behind and you shall be put in front keep out and you shall be kept in goodness strives not and therefore it is not rebuked he that humbles himself shall be preserved entire 
he that bends shall be made straight he that is empty shall be filled he that is worn out shall be renewed he who is little shall succeed he who is much shall go astray therefore the sage embraces unity and is a model for all under heaven he is free from self-display therefore he shines forth from self-assertion therefore he is distinguished from self-glorification therefore he has merit from self-exaltation therefore he rises superior to all inasmuch he does not strive there is no one in the world who can strive with him he who conscious of being strong is content to be weak he shall be a channel for the waters of the world and virtue will never desert him he returns to the state of a little child he who conscious of his own light is content to be obscure he shall be the whole world's model being the whole world's model his virtue will never fail he reverts to the absolute he who conscious of desert is content to suffer disgrace he shall be the cynosure of mankind being the cynosure of mankind his virtue then is full he returns to primal simplicity he who is great must make humility his base he who is high must make lowliness his foundation thus princes and kings in speaking of themselves use the terms lonely friendless of small account is not this making humility their base thus it is that some things are increased by being diminished others are diminished by being increased what others have taught i also teach the violent come to untimely ends i will make this the root of my teaching what makes a kingdom great is its being like a downflowing river the central point towards which all the smaller streams under heaven converge or like the female throughout the world who by quiescence always overcomes the male and quiescence is a form of humility therefore if a great kingdom humbles itself before a small kingdom it shall make the small kingdom its prize and if a small kingdom humbles itself before a great kingdom it shall win over that great kingdom thus the one humbles itself in order to attain the other attains because it is humble if the great kingdom has no further desire than to bring men together and to nourish them the small kingdom will have no further desire than to enter the service of the other but in order that both may have their desire the great one must learn humility the reason why rivers and seas are able to be lords over a hundred mountain streams is that they know how to keep below them that is why they are able to reign over all the mountain streams therefore the sage wishing to be above the people must by his words put himself below them wishing to be before the people he must put himself behind them in this way though he has his place above them the people do not feel his weight though he has his place before them they do not feel it as an injury therefore all mankind delight to exalt him and weary of him not the sage expects no recognition for what he does he achieves merit but does not take it to himself he does not wish to display his worth i have three precious things which i hold fast and prize the first is gentleness the second is frugality the third is humility which keeps me from putting myself before others be gentle and you can be bold be frugal and you can be liberal avoid putting yourself before others and you can become a leader among men but in the present day men cast off gentleness and are all for being bold they spurn frugality and retain only extravagance they discard humility and aim only at being first therefore they shall surely perish 
gentleness brings victory to him who attacks and safety to him who defends those whom heaven would save it fences round with gentleness the best soldiers are not warlike the best fighters do not lose their temper the greatest conquerors are those who overcome their enemies without strife the greatest directors of men are those who yield place to others this is called the virtue of not striving the capacity for directing mankind this is being the compeer of heaven it was the highest goal of the ancients government not exalting worth keeps the people from rivalry not prizing what is hard to procure keeps the people from theft not to show them what they may covet is the way to keep their minds from disorder therefore the sage when he governs empties their minds and fills their bellies weakens their inclinations and strengthens their bones his constant object is to keep the people without knowledge and without desire or to prevent those who have knowledge from daring to act he practices inaction and nothing remains ungoverned he who respects the state as his own person is fit to govern it he who loves the state as his own body is fit to be entrusted with it in the highest antiquity the people did not know that they had rulers in the next age they loved and praised them in the next they feared them in the next they despised them how cautious is this age how sparing of his words when his task is accomplished and affairs are prosperous the people all say we have come to be as we are naturally and of ourselves if any one desires to take the empire in hand and govern it i see that he will not succeed the empire is a divine utensil which may not be roughly handled he who meddles mars he who holds it by force loses it fishes must not be taken from the water the methods of government must not be exhibited to the people use uprightness in ruling a state employ indirect methods in waging war practice non-interference in order to win the empire now this is how i know what i lay down as restrictions and prohibitions are multiplied in the empire the people grow poorer and poorer when the people are subjected to overmuch government the land is thrown into confusion when the people are skilled in many cunning arts strange are the objects of luxury that appear the greater the number of laws and enactments the more thieves and robbers there will be therefore the sage says so long as i do nothing the people will work out their own reformation so long as i love calm the people will write themselves if only i keep from meddling the people will grow rich if only i am free from desire the people will come naturally back to simplicity if the government is sluggish and inert the people will be honest and free from guile if the government is prying and meddling the people will be discontented is it realized that the ultimate ideal is absence of government otherwise the straight will become the crooked and the good will revert to evil verily mankind have been under delusion for many a day govern a great nation as you would cook a small fish if the empire is governed according to tao disembodied spirits will not manifest supernatural powers it is not that they lack supernatural power but they will not use it to hurt mankind again it is not that they are unable to hurt mankind but they see that the sage also does not hurt mankind if then neither sage nor spirits work harm their virtue converges to one beneficent end in ancient times those who knew how to practice tao did not use it to enlighten the people but rather to keep them ignorant the difficulty of governing the people arises from their having too much knowledge if the people do not have to fear the majesty of the law a greater majesty will take its place do not confine them within too narrow bounds do not make their lives too weary for if you do not weary them of life 
then they will not grow weary of you if the people do not fear death what good is there in using death as a deterrent but if the people are brought up in fear of death regarding it as something unusual and we can take and execute them which of us will dare to do it now there is always one who presides over the infliction of death the man who would take his place and himself inflict death is like one who should try to do the work of a master carpenter and of those who try the work of a master carpenter there are few who do not cut their own hands the people starve because those in authority over them devour too many taxes that is why they starve the people are difficult to govern because those placed over them are meddlesome that is why they are difficult to govern the people despise death because of their excessive labor in seeking the means of life that is why they despise death a sage has said he who can take upon himself the nation's shame is fit to be lord of the land he who can take upon himself the nation's calamities is fit to be ruler over the empire were i a ruler of a little state with a small population and only ten or a hundred men available as soldiers i would not use them i would have the people look on death as a grievous thing and they should not travel to distant countries though they might possess boats and carriages they should have no occasion to ride in them though they might own weapons and armor they should have no need to use them i would make the people return to the use of knotted cords they should find their plain food sweet their rough garments fine they should be content with their homes and happy in their simple ways if a neighboring state was within sight of mine nay if we were close enough to hear the crowing of each other's cocks and the barking of each other's dogs the two peoples should grow old and die without there ever having been any mutual intercourse war he who serves a ruler of men in harmony with tao will not subdue the empire by force of arms such a course is wont to bring retribution in its train where troops have been quartered brambles and thorns spring up in the track of great armies there must follow lean years the good man wins a victory and then stops he will not go on to acts of violence winning he boasteth not he will not triumph he shows no arrogance he wins because he cannot choose after his victory he will not be overbearing weapons however beautiful are instruments of ill omen hateful to all creatures therefore he who has tao will have nothing to do with them where the princely man abides the weak left hand is in honor but he who uses weapons honors the stronger right weapons are instruments of ill omen they are not the instruments of the princely man who uses them only when he needs must peace and tranquillity are what he prizes when he conquers he is not elate to be elate were to rejoice in the slaughter of human beings and he who rejoices in the slaughter of human beings is not fit to work his will in the empire on happy occasions the left is favored on sad occasions the right the second in command has his place on the left the general in chief on the right that is to say they are placed in the order observed at funeral rites and indeed he who has exterminated a great multitude of men should bewail them with tears and lamentation it is well that those who are victorious in battle should be placed in the order of funeral rites a certain military commander used to say i dare not act the host i prefer to play the guest i dare not advance an inch i prefer to retreat a foot there is no greater calamity than lightly engaging in war lightly to engage in war is to risk the loss of our treasure when opposing warriors join in battle he who is pity conquers paradoxes among mankind the recognition of beauty as such implies the idea of ugliness and the recognition of good implies the idea of evil there is the same mutual relation between existence and non-existence 
in the matter of creation between difficulty and ease in the matter of accomplishing between long and short in the matter of form between high and low in the matter of elevation between treble and bass in the matter of musical pitch between before and after in the matter of priority nature is not benevolent she treats all created things like the straw dogs we use at sacrifices the sage is not benevolent he looks upon the people in the same way the space between heaven and earth is it not like a bellows it is empty yet inexhaustible when it puts in motion more and more comes out heaven and earth are long-lasting the reason why heaven and earth can last long is that they live not for themselves and thus they are able to endure thirty spokes unite in one nave the utility of the cart depends on the hollow centre in which the axle turns clay is moulded into a vessel the utility of the vessel depends on its hollow interior doors and windows are cut out in order to make a house the utility of the house depends on the empty spaces thus while the existence of things may be good it is the non-existent in them which makes them serviceable when the great tao falls into disuse benevolence and righteousness come into vogue when shrewdness and sagacity appear great hypocrisy prevails it is when the bonds of kinship are out of joint that filial piety and paternal affection begin it is when the state is in a ferment of revolution that loyal patriots arise cast off your holiness rid yourself of sagacity and the people will benefit a hundredfold discard benevolence and abolish righteousness and the people will return to filial piety and paternal love renounce your scheming and abandon gain and thieves and robbers will disappear these three precepts mean that outward show is insufficient and therefore they bid us to be true to our proper nature to show simplicity to embrace plain dealing to reduce selfishness to moderate desire a variety of colors makes man's eye blind a diversity of sounds makes man's ear deaf a mixture of flavors makes man's palate dull he who knows others is clever but he who knows himself is enlightened he who overcomes others is strong but he who overcomes himself is mightier still he is rich who knows when he has enough he who acts with energy has strength of purpose he who moves not from his proper place is long-lasting he who dies but perishes not enjoys true longevity if you would contract you must first expand if you would weaken you must first strengthen if you would overthrow you must first raise up if you would take you must first give this is called obscuring one's light he who is most perfect seems to be lacking yet his resources are never outworn he who is most full seems vacant yet his uses are inexhaustible extreme straightness is as bad as crookedness extreme cleverness is as bad as folly extreme fluency is as bad as stammering those who know do not speak those who speak do not know abandon learning and you will be free from trouble and distress failure is the foundation of success and the means by which it is achieved success is the lurking place of failure but who can tell when the turning point will come he who acts destroys he who grasps loses therefore the sage does not act and so does not destroy he does not grasp and so he does not lose only he who does nothing for his life's sake can truly be said to value his life man at his birth is tender and weak at his death he is rigid and strong plants and trees when they come forth are tender and crisp when dead they are dry and tough thus rigidity and strength are the concomitants of death softness and weakness are the concomitant to life hence the warrior that is strong does not conquer 
the tree that is strong is cut down. Therefore, the strong and the big take the lower place, the soft and the weak take the higher place. There is nothing in the world more soft and weak than water, yet for attacking things that are hard and strong, there is nothing that surpasses it, nothing that can take its place. The soft overcomes the hard, the weak overcomes the strong. There is no one in the world but knows this truth, and no one who can put it into practice. Those who are wise have no wide range of learning. Those who range most widely are not wise. The sage does not care to hoard. The more he uses for the benefit of others, the more he possesses himself. The more he gives to his fellow men, the more he has of his own. The truest sayings are paradoxical. Miscellaneous Sayings and Precepts By many words, wit is exhausted. It is better to retain what is in the heart. The excellence of a dwelling is its sight. The excellence of a mind is its profundity. The excellence of giving is charitableness. The excellence of speech is truthfulness. The excellence of government is order. The excellence of action is ability. The excellence of movement is timeliness. He who grasps more than he can hold would be better without any. If a house is crammed with treasures of gold and jade, it will be impossible to guard them all. He who prides himself upon wealth and honor hastens his own downfall. He who strikes with a sharp point will not himself be safe for long. By uniting the intelligent and animal souls and embracing unity, can you avoid dissolution? By concentrating your breath and striving to make it soft, can you become like a little child? By purifying your spiritual vision, can you become without a flaw? The sage attends to the inner and not to the outer. He puts away the objective and holds to the subjective. Between yes and yea, how small the difference. Between good and evil, how great the difference. What the world reverences may not be treated with disrespect. He who has not faith in others shall find no faith in them. To see oneself is to be clear of sight. Mighty is he who conquers himself. He who raises himself on tiptoe cannot stand firm. He who stretches his legs wide apart cannot walk. Racing and hunting excite man's heart to madness. The struggle for rare possessions drives a man to actions injurious to himself. The heavy is the foundation of the light. Repose is the ruler of unrest. The wise prince in his daily course never departs from gravity and repose. Though he possesses a gorgeous palace, he will dwell therein with calm indifference. How should the lord of a myriad chariots conduct himself with levity in the empire? Levity loses men's hearts. Unrest loses the throne. The skillful traveler leaves no tracks. The skillful speaker makes no blunders. The skillful reckoner uses no tallies. He who knows how to shut uses no bolts, yet you cannot open. He who knows how to bind uses no cords, yet you cannot undo. Among men reject none. Among things reject nothing. This is called comprehensive intelligence. The good man is the bad man's teacher. The bad man is the material upon which the good man works. If the one does not value his teacher, if the other does not love his material, then despite their sagacity, they must go far astray. This is a mystery of great import. As unwrought materials divided up and made into serviceable vessels, so the sage turns his simplicity to account, and thereby becomes the ruler of rulers. The course of things is such that what was in front is now behind, what was hot is now cold, what was strong is now weak, what was complete is now in ruin. Therefore, the sage avoids excess, extravagance, and grandeur. Which is nearer to you, fame or life? Which is more to you, life or wealth? Which is the greater malady, gain or loss? 
excessive ambitions necessarily entail great sacrifice much hoarding must be followed by heavy loss he who knows when he has enough will not be put to shame he who knows when to stop will not come to harm such a man can look forward to long life there is no sin greater than yielding to ambition no calamity greater than discontent no vice greater than covetousness he who has known the contentment of being contented will always be content do not wish to be rare like jade or common like stone the sage has no hard and fast ideas but he shares the ideas of the people and makes them his own living in the world he has the appearance of timidity and for the world's sake keeps his mind in a state of flux the people all fix their eyes and ears upon him the sage looks upon all as his children i have heard that he who possesses the secret of life when travelling abroad will not flee from rhinoceros or tiger when entering a hostile camp he will not equip himself with sword or buckler the rhinoceros finds in him no place to insert its horn the tiger has nowhere to fasten its claw the soldier has nowhere to thrust his blade and why because he has no spot where death can enter to see small beginnings is clearness of sight to rest in weakness is strength he who knows how to plant shall not have his plant uprooted he who knows how to hold a thing shall not have it taken away sons and grandsons will worship at his shrine which shall endure from generation to generation knowledge of harmony is the secret of the unchanging knowledge of the unchanging means enlightenment to increase life is of evil omen the mind directing the vital force is strength the sage is square but not angular strict without injuring others straightforward but not unrestrained luminous but not dazzling good words shall gain you honor in the marketplace but good deeds shall gain you friends among men to the good i would be good to the not good i would also be good in order to make them good with the faithful i would keep faith with the unfaithful i would also keep faith in order that they may become faithful even if a man is bad how can it be right to cast him off requite injury with kindness the difficult things of this world must once have been easy the great things of this world must once have been small set about difficult things while they are still easy do great things while they are still small the sage never affects to do anything great and therefore he is able to achieve his great results he who always thinks things easy is sure to find them difficult therefore the sage ever anticipates difficulties and thus it is he never encounters them while times are quiet it is easy to take action ere coming troubles have cast their shadows it is easy to lay plans that which is brittle is easily broken that which is minute is easily dissipated take precautions before the evil appears regulate things before disorder has begun the tree which needs two arms to span its girth sprang from the tiniest shoot yon tower nine stories high rose from a little mound of earth a journey of a thousand miles began with a single step a great principle cannot be divided therefore it is that many containers cannot contain it the sage knows what is in him but makes no display he respects himself but seeks not honor for himself to know but to be as though not knowing is the height of wisdom not to know and yet to affect knowledge is a vice if we regard this vice as such we shall escape it the sage has not this vice it is because he regards it as a vice that he escapes it use the light that is in you to revert to your natural clearness of sight then the loss of the body is unattended by calamity this is called doubly enduring in the management of affairs people constantly break down just when they are nearing a successful issue if they took as much care at the end as at the beginning they would not fail in their enterprises he who lightly promises is sure to keep but little faith he whose boldness leads him to venture 
will be slain he who is brave enough not to venture will live of these two one has the benefit the other has the hurt but who is it that knows the real cause of heaven's hatred this is why the sage finds it difficult to act the violent and stiff-necked die not by a natural death true words are not fine fine words are not true the good are not contentious the contentious are not good this is the way of heaven which benefits and injures not this is the way of the sage in whose actions there is no element of strife lao tzu on himself alas the barrenness of the age has not yet reached its limit all men are radiant with happiness as if enjoying a great feast as if mounted on a tower in spring i alone am still and give as yet no sign of joy i am like an infant which has not yet smiled forlorn is one who has nowhere to lay his head other men have plenty while i alone seem to have lost all i am a man foolish in heart dull and confused other men are full of light i alone seem to be in darkness other men are alert i alone am listless i am unsettled as the ocean drifting as though i had no stopping place all men have their usefulness i alone am stupid and clownish lonely though i am and unlike other men yet i revere the foster mother Tao. my words are very easy to understand very easy to put into practice yet the world can neither understand nor practice them my words have a clue my actions have an underlying principle it is because men do not know the clue that they understand me not those who know me are but few and on that account my honour is the greater thus the sage wears coarse garments but carries a jewel in his bosom end of lao tzu on himself end of the sayings of lao tzu by lao tzu translated by lionel giles